Hungry for Peace, How You Can Help End Poverty and War with Food Not Bombs, by Keith McHenry. Illustrated, designed, and written by Food Not Bombs, co-founder Keith McHenry, all photos taken by Food Not Bombs volunteers, with exception of back cover picture of the author taken by Henry Grossman. Preface, by Food Not Bombs, co-founder Joe Swanson. Copyright 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015 by Keith McHenry. All rights reserved. ISBN 78-193-172-5. All Food Not Bombs activists can reproduce the materials in this book for use in their work and are invited to contact the Food Not Bombs office listed below to share news about the use of the content. All other inquiries regarding requests to reprint all or part of Hungry for Peace, how you can help end poverty and war with Food Not Bombs should be sent to C Sharp Press, P.O. Box 1731, Tucson, Arizona, 85702, USA, 520-628-8720, www.csharpress.com. You can contact Food Not Bombs at Food Not Bombs, P.O. Box 424. Arroyo Seco, New Mexico, USA, 1800-884-1136. www.foodnotbombs.net.mchenrykeith, 1957. With over a billion people going hungry each day, how can we spend another dollar on war? First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Martin Niemöller, 1892-1984. Howard Zinn's foreword to the First Food Not Bombs book. This is an extraordinary book, written by an extraordinary community of people. Their presence became known to me quite gradually. Over a long period of time, I began to notice their tables, their signs, and cauldrons of hot soup and supplies of nutritious veg. Eat tables at meetings, at demonstrations, and on city streets. Then one night I was invited to a gathering, a place for poets, musicians, and performers of all sorts who were possessed of some social consciousness. And there was a counter at the side of the room and, again, that sign, food, not bombs. This time I paid more than ordinary attention because I recognized the man behind the counter, Eric Weinberger. I had met him 25 years before on the road from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in the Great Civil Rights. March of 1965, and again in 1977, in another march, this time of anti-nuclear activists, into the site of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. Now another dozen years had elapsed, and he was, with food, not bombs. I thought these food not. Bombs folk are carrying on the long march of the American people, moving slowly but inexorably towards a livable society. The message of food, not. Bombs is simple and powerful. No one should be without food in a world so richly provided with land, sun, and human ingenuity. No consideration of money, no demand for profit, should stand in the way of any hungry or malnourished child or any adult in need. Here are people who will not be bamboozled by the laws of the market that say only people who can afford to buy something can have it. Even before the recent collapse of the Soviet Union, it was an absurd and immoral policy to spend hundreds of billions of dollars each year to support a nuclear arsenal that, if used, would bring about the greatest genocide in human history and, if not used, would constitute an enormous theft from the American people. Today, with no Soviet threat, the policy of spending a trillion dollars over the next few years to maintain a nuclear arsenal, other weapons, and a worldwide network of military bases is even more absurd. The slogan, food not bombs, is even more recognizable today as clear common sense. This slogan requires no complicated analysis. Those three words say it all. They point unerringly to the double challenge, to feed immediately people who are without adequate food, and to replace a system whose priorities are power and profit with one meeting the needs of all human beings. It is rare to find a book that combines long, range, wisdom with practical advice, but here is a treasury of such advice. It tells in specific detail how to form a food not bombs group, how to collect food, how to prepare it, yes, wonderful recipes, and how to distribute it. Every step in this process is intertwined with a warning. Do not allow self-appointed leaders or elites to make important decisions. Decisions must be made democratically, with as wide a participation as possible, aiming to reach a consensus. The idea here is profound, if we want. A good society we need not shout, but rather show how life should be lived. Yes, this book is truly nutritious. Professor Howard Zinn is the author of A People's History of the United States. Professor Zinn told me he would love to write a new foreword for this book and asked me to send him the final draft, but he unfortunately passed away two months after I spoke with it to him at Campaign to End the Death Penalty's ninth Annual Convention in Chicago. Because food is a right, not a privilege. Because there is enough food for everyone to eat. Because scarcity is a patriarchal lie. Because a woman should not have to use her body to get a meal or have a place to sleep. Because when we are hungry or homeless, we have the right to get what we need by panning, busking, or squatting. Because poverty is a form of violence not necessary or natural. Because capitalism makes food a source of profit, not a source of nutrition. Because food grows on trees. Because we need community control. Because we need homes, not jails. Because we need dot food, not bombs. Preface by Joe Swanson.
Once upon a time, there was a small group of friends who thought they could change the world. They lived in a rundown house in a rough neighborhood. They had very little money and no political power at all. They had nothing to support their bold belief other than youthful optimism and a marginal grip on reality. With no heat, they sat around the stove through cold winter nights and talked about their ideas. They made plans. They dreamed out loud. One day, they cooked a pot of soup and went downtown. They set up a makeshift table and served that soup to hungry people right in front of a big fat bank. The warm and well-dressed wealthy walked on by, pretending not to see. It was her that day. I brought a drum and played it. It was the only thing I could think of to do, besides occasional turns at the table, serving soup. Drumming was something he could owl, and he happened to have a drum. So I played until my fingers bled, believing that if I didn't give up, I could make those people see us. Then maybe they would do something about the terrible injustice of hunger that was right before their eyes. Thirty years later, I walked across the street to take a break from work. It was a warmish spring day, though there was still plenty of snow on the mountains. I bought a cup of tea and read flyers at the cafe, mostly announcements for concerts here in Durango and nearby Telluride. One of them had a familiar logo, a purple fist wielding an orange carrot. Food not bombs co-founder Keith McHenry to speak at Fort Lewis College, it proclaimed. Lunch will be served. I pulled out my cell phone and called me old friend. You're coming to Durango? I was going to call you. It's been real busy around here. You have to stay at my pee place. Sure, meet me at the college. On the designated day, I went to the college, but Keith was not there. He had been delayed on his way from San Francisco. A handful of young people stood around a folding table with tea and soup. They looked a bit concerned. A small crowd waited on the benches nearby. After a moment of internal debate, I approached the table. Listen, if you need someone to fill in, I can talk about food, not bombs. I'm a CEO founder, too. The kids were grateful, the crowd was polite, and I made it through the impromptu speech without too many side trips into my own personal stories. Of course, I could not talk about anything food, not bombs has done in the past 10 years, since I left San Francisco and moved to this quiet mountain town. But before that time, I was always in proximity to the action. I could talk about the long lines of homeless people waiting in front of City Hall, the arrests and beatings of volunteers, the buckets of soup and bags of bread hurled onto the sidewalk and smashed under officers' boots. We had a radio station back then, unlicensed of course, from which we would broadcast Keith's calls from prison. With each arrest, food not bombs grew bigger. Oppression was like a fertilizer. Every time that boot stamped down, it only served to till the earth and push the seeds of resistance deeper. New groups sprouted up all over the world. When I left San Francisco, I knew Food Not Bombs didn't need me anymore. It had a life of its own. People come to eat with one of the Moscow Food Not Bombs chapters in the Russian capital. Food Not Bombs. Volunteers risk arrest sharing vegan meals in Orlando, Florida. After the speech, I hung out with the local F&B group for a while. Young, clear-eyed, and kind-hearted, they had abundant ideas for ways to build a better world. For the past decade, I have been concerned with building sheds, fences, and garden beds. I have been writing, trying to make a difference with language. Words are my drum beats now. I had forgotten about building with a big B. That's when you take a bold idea and step out into the world with it, or to make it real by the sheer force of belief and action. That's what these kids were doing. I was proud of them, but didn't say so, hoping not to seem like a dotty old grandma. Keith arrived late that night. He drove an aging blue school bus painted with flowers and food not bombs on its side. It rattled down the dirt road under moonlight, past silent fields, looking only a little out of place. It was great to see him again. We talked about our lives. He had been touring Europe, meeting food not bombs groups, and speaking in Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam. I had been doing the usual, working, building small b, and writing, 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 boom, boom, boom. We spoke of old friends, that long ago group of dreamers. We didn't all stay with food, not bombs, of course. We followed our individual paths. We became teachers, writers, dancers, clowns, even parents. The one common thread is that we're all still trying to make the world a better place. Not long after Keith's visit, I went down to the Riverside Park on a Sunday where Durango F&B serves their weekly meal. The picnic tables were well populated, not only with people eating. This particular group had initiated a free market. Blankets were spread on the grass, with items that you could just take if you wanted. I got a couple of books and some seed potatoes for the garden. Then I grabbed a plate and joined a few of the older folks on a bench. Isn't this wonderful? A woman asked me. I nodded, mouth full. It's so nice to see young people doing something good with their lives. It makes me think there's still hope for this crazy world. Hmm, I replied. That's the best thing about it. The simple act of sharing is a powerful force. It is the opposite of greed. It exposes the lie of scarcity and necessary deprivation. If we can do away with greed, we will do away with hunger, poverty, and war. Greed will not be wished out of existence, but we can shove it out with the practice of radical public sharing. This book is a map, not the actual road. Take it and blaze your own trail to a better world. Let your dreams guide you and your heart always have the final say. If you do the best you can with whatever you have, you will find your way. 30 years ago, that was just a bold belief. Now I know it's true. Have a good time. Bon voyage. And thank you. Joe Swanson, Food Not Bombs co-founder. Durango, Colorado, August 24, 2010. Food Not Bombs sharing food at a protest for the right to squat empty buildings in Lithuania. An introduction. After the riots. My young Serbian guide, Rebel Mouse, pried open a crack in the metal fence that surrounded the old brick mansion in central. Belgrade. I followed him down a garden path, over piles of brickstow, a skeleton of a stairway, and up to the top floor. After stumbling around in the dark, 
Rebel Mouse suggested we enter one of the doors. Five young Food Not Bombs volunteers were sitting on water-soaked mattresses in the only warm room of the building they called Rebel House. They warmed their hands over an electric heater. A dim yellow bulb lit our conversation, which quickly turned to war. It started with their interest in the movie Bowling for Columbine. Was Michael Moore's movie true? Do Americans have guns? They asked. I had just finished Moore's latest book, Dude, Where's My Country, and reported he was supporting Wesley Clark for president. Emma was 17, dimly lit face framed with waves of natural red hair. She was dedicated to food not. Bombs when she wasn't busy with her courses in medicine. Wesley Clark for president? You must be kidding. Wesley Clark destroyed our country. Emma couldn't contain herself. I went to stay at my mother's apartment the first night of the war. She lives on the 10th floor. We sat nervously watching the war start on TV. My mother started to rock back and forth in her chair. I never saw her like this. As images of jets and missiles crossed the television screen, she rocked faster and faster. Sirens were blaring outside. Then suddenly, the apartment building rocked. The reporter announced that cruise missiles had destroyed a radio tower in the outskirts of Belgrade. Then an explosion, and everything went dark. My mother screamed that we had to get to the basement. I took her hand and led her down the stairs, feeling the wall with my other hand. Other residents were also stumbling down the stairs. A few minutes after we arrived in the basement, there was another explosion and screams at the door. Someone opened the metal latch and my uncle fell into the room covered in blood. Shards of glass sticking out of his face. Emma was also working as an intern at a hospital. There are over 700 children in our hospital. The depleted uranium dropped on Serbia. Caused these children to be born without arms, legs, eyes. One child has an arm growing out of the top of his head. Americans should see what Wesley Clark has done. They shared story after story about surviving the war. Watching cruise missiles lumber slowly above the streets of Belgrade until they found their target. Everyone lost friends and family. Then I asked to use their toilet. We used the crater in the room across the hall. Watch out that you don't fall in. Their toilet was made by a misfired cruise missile that crashed through the roof and failed to explode. Back home in Taos, New Mexico, I was sharing lunch at the plaza. I noticed a friend, Mary, sitting with her bowl of rice and vegetables sobbing, tears streaming down her cheeks. Keith, I can't take it anymore. I just can't believe we could lose our home. She wiped the tears from the right side of her face. I sat next to her and gently held her. We had tried the Obama administration's Making Home Affordable program, but it wasn't any help. Our application was shared with every mortgage modification company, and they have been calling night and day with false promises of help. Her husband couldn't get work. No one was hiring builders, and he was growing more frustrated each day. Her marriage was strained to the breaking point. She worried for her two young children. Her American dream had become the American nightmare. This book was written to encourage people like yourself to participate in Food Not Bombs. To work to end the tragic brutality recounted in stories like those shared by Emma. To end an economic and political system that causes the suffering of people like your friend Mary. I hope you will be inspired to rush out and take action as soon as you finish reading this book. This book also comes out at a time when people are rising up against the austerity programs that are increasing hunger and poverty. High food prices are sparking riots and driving dictators from their thrones. While the Arab Spring gave hope to millions, it has also made it clear that the most important actions can happen after the riots, when corporate power seeks to replace the fallen government with another one that they also control. The old communist dictators became the new democratic leaders with the blessings of global capital. Young activists face the same crisis in North Africa and the Middle East, filling the power vacuum created by natural economic or political crisis with a compassionate community-based system where everyone participates and no one goes hungry or lives in poverty is the central objective of food, not bombs. More than collecting, cooking, and sharing free food with the hungry and at protests, food not. Bombs volunteers are practicing working together using consensus and implementing their visions independent of government or corporate control. This is one reason why we are considered a threat. Our efforts might be small, but they are the foundation of any sustained transition to a self-governed community. Everyone needs food. Rioters need food. Communities freed. From corporate domination will need to eat, and the skills required to collect and share food can be translated into the growing of food. Providing safe fresh water, providing shelter, health care, education, entertainment, and all the things a healthy, free community would desire. Our groups strive to make decisions using consensus so that everyone has access to determining the direction of the community. We seek to build interest in our ideas by always displaying our food, not bombs banner, and providing literature every meal to encourage dialogue on the subjects most affecting the public. We also provide healthy food, making it possible for people to be free to follow their dreams. There are many actions you can take. You don't have to volunteer with our group, but you might start by participating with the Food Not Bombs movement until you find what moves you the most. If your community doesn't have a local group, you can initiate a chapter. There are organic gardens to cultivate, homeless families to house, and exploitive policies and damaging corporate activities to stop. There are environmental peace and social justice campaigns to plan, and activists to feed. There is an emergency in it. We'll take everyone working together in us to implement the changes necessary for a sustainable future. The more people that practice these skills with Food Not Bombs, the better prepared we will be to support one another after the riots, and the less likely it will be in vain and our movement will be co-opted.
you can make a difference. When my friends and I first started Food Not Bombs, we couldn't have imagined the impact it would have 30 years later. We couldn't pay our rent, but we had the enthusiasm and desire to confront the policies of the Reagan revolution. We tried to have the most impact possible on society by making the most of what little we had, time and imagination. If we had any hope of changing society, we had to make as powerful an impression as we could on as many people as our resources would allow. Our message would be ignored if it was confined to an office. We wouldn't motivate anyone if we didn't. Get their attention. So, we set out to show it was possible to feed the hungry, tasty vegetarian meals under the banner Food Not. Bombs while performing colorful spectacles, illuminating the critical issues of the day to live music. To back up our ideas with deeds, we recovered soon to be discarded food and provided free. Groceries to hundreds of New England's hungriest families at. Housing projects, soup kitchens, and shelters. We provided meals to protesters and helped organize marches, rallies, and other actions. To protest the policies of Reagan and his corporate masters, it worked. Before long, we attracted volunteers, food, donations, and invitations to share food at protests from Maine to Washington, D.C. Our daily dependable food collection and distribution built credibility. We walked our talk. At first we thought it would be fun, but experiencing the gratitude of the people we fed couldn't have been more rewarding. We thought we might wake a few people up to the idea that our world would be a lot better if we redirected some of our military spending towards domestic priorities. But we sure couldn't have predicted that in 30 years there would be volunteers organizing for a social change and feeding the hungry with food, not bombs groups in over 1,000 communities around the world. People really got interested in starting local food, not bombs groups when we faced intense police interference. First, when police made nearly 100 arrests in San Francisco in 1988. With each wave of arrests and beatings after that, there came another wave of new food, not bombs groups. Every campaign against food, not bombs inspired the creation of more groups, and existing chapters responded by adding meals to their schedule or by organizing homes, not jails, housing takeovers. Arrests in communities around California inspired more groups all over the world. New arrests in other states were followed by the formation of more groups in every comer of the world. Economic crisis, strikes, wars, earthquakes, hurricanes, repressive laws, free trade agreements, racist attacks, animal abuse, and threats to the environment motivated people to participate in food, not bombs. The arrests in Orlando, Florida, and the support of cyber activists calling themselves the People's Liberation Front attracted more interest in food, not bombs. Most importantly, our literature tables and meals. Shared under the banner Food Not Bombs invited conversation and participation in our movement. The message of Food Not Bombs has traveled throughout the world by word of mouth, flyers, videos, fanzines, the internet, web, music, news reports, and, most importantly, by example. The joy of sharing free food with the hungry has inspired volunteers to overcome the obstacles of personal poverty and bureaucracy. The dream of a world at peace with abundance can seem within reach while doing the work of food, not bombs. Food not. Bombs is an antidote to the sense of hopelessness that many people can feel with the magnitude of today's economic, political, and environmental crisis. The joy of sharing food and working for social change is an inspiration for volunteers around the world. Both. Volunteers and the people that depend on our food have expressed. That food, not bombs, has changed their lives. A young mother with three girls came across the food, not bombs table I was. Staffing outside the Food Conspiracy CO op on 4th Avenue in Tucson, Arizona first, the days before the United States launched its shock and awe attack on Iraq. Food, not bombs, you saved my life. As one of her girls tugged on her blouse to go and the other two squirmed, she opened her purse and pulled out a 20 dollar bill and placed it into our donation can. I was on the way to the bridge over the Sacramento River to throw me girls and myself to our death when I happened upon your people sharing food in the park. They were so nice and treated us with respect. The other agencies humiliated me and I couldn't take it anymore. But Food Not Bombs was different, so I gave up my plan to end my life. The three principles of Food Not Bombs provide your strength and make it possible for people to organize local chapters in a variety of cultures and economic situations. In particular, most social movements that start in the United States are quickly crushed or co-opted by corporate interests or the government, but this has not happened with Food Not Bombs. Our decentralized, non-hierarchical structure and use of consensus for direct democracy has protected food, not bombs, from co-optation. The founders of Food Not Bombs thought that there might be a way to encourage the public to seek an end to war and poverty with a living theater and mutual aid on the streets. No length of theories and long-winded speech has to bore the public. We also made sure there would never be any charismatic leaders for the authority as to discredit or leadership for them to replace. Our Food Not Bombs is about action, reliability, respect, trust, and relationships in the community. We are about making sure everyone is free to express their best self and has the food, clothing, health care, and housing they deserve. In short, we were searching for a way to reach a public unfamiliar with alternative ways of organizing society and of relating to our fellow animal and human beings. Every bowl of free food that a Food Not Bombs volunteer shares with their community is a step in that direction. I started writing this book in Washington, D.C. during the first years of the Obama administration sitting in an air-conditioned cafe on breaks from baking bread in a solar oven on Pennsylvania Avenue outside the White House to encourage, as our banner said, the change we need now. Congress was creating a national health care bill, America was struggling with unemployment at levels near those of the Great Depression, and over 3 million families foreclosed on their homes. There were reports of a global food crisis, food riots, and escalating wars against Afghanistan and Pakistan. 
In November 2009, I received news of the police confiscating a Food Not Bombs banner during the weekly meal in Flagstaff, Arizona, and reports that health inspectors had ordered the Lancaster, Pennsylvania chapter to stop feeding the hungry after a land mine manufacturer made a complaint to city officials. Police took plates of food out of the hands of hungry people who were hoping to eat with Food Not Bombs in Concord, California. The city of Orlando took Food Not Bombs to 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta after the district court ruled the city had violated the group's right to free expression and ordered the city to pay our attorneys $200,000. But Food Not Bombs lost the appeal. On April 12, 2011, the court ruled that the First Amendment rights of Food Not Bombs were protected since the Orlando law let us share food and literature twice a year per park. Phil and the other Florida activists called me in house reporting that the police had raided the Fort Lauderdale Food Not Bombs house and that cities all over the state were about to pass laws against the sharing of meals with the hungry. I toured Florida in May 2011, helping each chapter collect, cook, and share vegan meals. I also spoke to audiences about the history and principles of Food Not Bombs. While Freya spent me nights sleeping in me 1987 Chevy van, drifting off to sleep listening to the news on the BBC. Drone attacks mixed with environmental crisis, including floods, droughts, and extreme weather, followed by reports of famine, economic failures in Europe, the United States, and threats of another economic recession or even depression. The city of Orlando started arresting Food Not Bombs volunteers on June 1, 2011. I was arrested a second time on June 22 and spent 17 days in the freezing cold Orange County Jail. News only became more dire once I was liberated from my media-free stay behind bars. One crisis after another encouraged me to complete this book and strengthen the Food Not Bombs movement. Each year, Food Not Bombs activists meet at regional and national gatherings and share news about the increase in people coming to eat and stories of new laws designed to drive poverty out of sight. Activists at the 2008 gathering in Asheville were already alarmed by poverty, but a few months after women, the American economy crashed. As I traveled to help local Food Not Bombs groups, I saw more and more families arriving at our meals looking like ghosts from Dorothy Lynch's Great Depression photos. Children with smudged faces and large frightened eyes clung to their mother's legs. Food Not Bombs saved me son's life, explained one woman. If it wasn't for the Food Not Bombs kids in, Gainesville had no they've survived to birth. People that had been living average middle C-class suburban lives were showing up to eat, having moved in with their families or friends after foreclosing on their homes. Some people reported that they were camping at the state park or told us they ate at Food Not Bombs so they would have enough money to pay their mortgage. The picture is even more devastating globally. In 2011, the number of people who went to bed hungry grew from 800 million to over a billion in less than a year, not because it was impossible to grow enough for all to eat, but because of selfish policies of corporate leaders and the governments they control. Over 25,000 people perished dianable to get enough food. According to the World Bank, the cost of seven most important food staples increased from December 2006 to March 2008 by 71% on average. Rice and grain prices increased by 126%, forcing families in the poorest countries to spend between 60 to 80% of her income on food. Sir John Holmes, Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and the UN's Emergency Relief Coordinator, noted in 2008 that the security implications of food crisis should also not be underestimated, as food riots are already being reported across the globe. Current food price trends are likely to increase sharply both the incidence and depth of food insecurity. The June 16, 2010 edition of The Guardian United Kingdom published a report on the future of food prices saying that Food prices are set to rise as much as 40% over the coming decade amid growing demand from emerging markets and for biofuel production, according to a United Nations report today, which warns of rising hunger and food insecurity. Later that summer, fires and droughts in Russia reduced the country's wheat harvest, causing the government to declare that he would not export any of that year's harvest. 25% of the Russian wheat harvest was lost in 2010. Wheat prices climbed 50% in the two months after the United Nations announcement in June. Are there concern that food costs would increase by 40% during the next few years? Pakistan lost half a million tons of wheat, as well as much of its rice crop, because of the 2010 catastrophic floods. World rice prices increased in 2010 after 15 to 20 percent of Pakistan's summer crop was destroyed in that country's worst flood in a generation. There were droughts and then flood Senegar. The United Nations claims more than 7 million people in Senegar face food shortages because of the floods. 11 million people were facing starvation in eastern Africa in the summer of 2011. These are signs that climate change is already contributing to hunger. It was reported. The world may be on the brink of a major new food crisis caused by environmental disasters and rampant market speculation. The UN was warned today at an emergency meeting on food price inflation at the emergency meeting of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization on September 24, 2010. The Food Outlook report, issued in November 2010 by the UN FAO, predicted prices would increase dramatically to levels as high as levels in 2007 and 2008 that sparked riots. On January 5, 2011, news headlines announced food prices just hit an all-time high. World hunger was increasing. Commodity speculation, the increased use of food for ethanol, droughts, floods, and extreme temperatures from the changing climate, and finally, corporate claims of ownership to tens of thousands of years of genetic history by patenting seeds were driving up food prices and hunger. The cost of food is increasing from the seeds to the plate. The increased use of genetically engineered crops is one of the factors most contributing to the global rise in hunger. 
corn seed prices rose 32% in 2009, and soybean seeds were up 24% from 2009 to 2010. Many farmers are not able to grow their own seed sand or no force of buy new seeds every season from companies like Monsanto. These seeds often require special chemicals to germinate and additional designer chemicals are required as fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Farmers are under pressure to borrow huge sums from banks to purchase the chemicals and equipment required in their contracts with suppliers and buyers. Tens of thousands of farmers are forced off their land each year as they find it impossible to pay their loans. Hundreds of farmers commit suicide each year, notably in India, distraught over losing a way of life, passed on from generation to generation. Thousands of acres of fertile land are sold to housing speculators or retail malls just to pay off loans incurred trying to farm genetically engineered produce. With little in the way of competition, seed prices will increase. Just 10 global corporations control 67% of the commercial seed industry, with half of that being controlled by Monsanto, DuPont, and Syngenta. When I believe that Monsanto has control over as much as 90% of seed genetics, this level of control is almost unbelievable, said Neil Harl, agricultural economist at Iowa State University, who has studied the seed industry for decades. The upshot of that is that it's tightening Monsanto's control and makes it possible for them to increase their prices long term. And we've seen this happening the last five years, and the end is not in sight. If a farmer tries to harvest their own seeds, they can be sued by Monsanto. The company claims they get as many as 500 tips a year about farmers harvesting their own seeds or otherwise failing to pay Monsanto for seeds that may have been contaminated with their genetic information. Percy Schmeiser might be the most famous farmer of Monsanto's victims after the company contaminated his canola crop, canola that was handed down from his father and grandfather, cultivated for nearly a hundred years on his family's farm in Bruno, Saskatchewan. Homan McFarling was also sued by Monsanto for planting seeds he had saved from the year before at his 5,000-acre farm in Shannon, Mississippi. Some farmers have even been sentenced to jail for hiding seeds from Monsanto, seeds contaminated by Monsanto. This contamination is not limited to commercial farmers. Hopi elders claim that 30% of their ancient corn may have been cross-pollinated with genetically engineered crops. Most genetically engineered crops are subsidized BYUS taxpayers and fed to animals for use in fast food establishments or low-quality packaged meals. According to the latest United Nations studies, industrial agriculture is responsible for nearly 70% of global freshwater consumption, using 38% of all land used for human purposes, and causing 19% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. This is largely due to corporate farming of subsidized meat. United Nations FAO's report Livestock's Long Shadow claims that 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions can be linked to animal agriculture. These are only some of the examples that hunger and poverty is an increasingly urgent crisis. At the same time I was working on this book, the United States Congress was busy drafting a federal food safety law. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 76 million people in the United States get sick every year with foodborne illness resulting in over 5,000 deaths nationwide. Massive industrial farming operations are responsible for most cases of illness from food. Even so, the new food safety laws do not address the most dangerous aspects of industrial agriculture. Millions of animals living in cramped conditions fed genetically engineered grains provide the perfect environment to promote disease in giant stockyards, airless poultry sheds, and high-speed slaughter facilities. The Food Safety Modernization Act was drafted with the aid of Michael Taylor, the Monsanto executive responsible for the comm. Penny's campaigns to block the labeling of genetically engineered foods and conceal the dangers of RBGH, growth hormones, and dairy cattle. He not only helped draft the bill, but President Obama appointed him to be America's first food safety czar. The Food Safety Modernization Act is supported by corporate interests like the Snack Food Association, General Mills, and Kraft Foods North America, while opposed by the National Family Farm Coalition and the Small Farms Conservancy. The cost of compliance forced malorganic farmers could force them out of business or underground at a time when many Americans are starting to support community-based agriculture, buying their food at farmers' markets as well as cultivating their own gardens. Some of the requirements might be both expensive and harmful to the nutrition of organically grown food. These policies also support the system that transports food an average of 500 miles from farm to plate. Disruptions in access to oil are already leading to food shortages within, increasing cost of healthy meals, food shortages only worsen. Many of these regulations require large amounts of money for compliance and favor industrial food producers, while threatening to bankrupt local agriculture. The Food Safety Modernization Act could contribute to an increase in the cost of food and may reduce its nutritional value as well. As food corporations seek more power, more people will go hungry, and what food people can afford will not be any safer to consume. While hunger, homelessness, and poverty increase, military spending is at an all-time high. World military expenditures were estimated to be $1.531 trillion in 2009. The United States spent over $800 billion on its war against Iraq, while it increased its spending to $6.70 billion per month in Afghanistan in 2010. Obama asked for an or military spending in 2011, while the guesting HUD cut Social Security, Medicare, and other social services and a budget compromise with the Tea Party Republicans. Over 44 million Americans depended on food stamps as our country spent billions on its military. The global environment and economy are in crisis. We are facing unimaginable horrors under the current corporate and political leadership. 
Corporations are free to buy American elections. European governments are following America's example, cutting essential services while bailing out the transnational corporations. Chaos rules and recorner off the earth. By the time you read, this things could be so much more dire that these facts might look good. There has never been a more important time for people to participate in the work of Food Not Bombs. This book I is intended to replace our first book, Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community, reflecting the changes Food Not Bombs has experienced over the past three decades. Food Not Bombs has grown to a global movement, so the details that once focused on the United States now seek to include all areas of the world from the ingredients and recipes, legal issues that Food Not Bombs volunteers might face, to the data about hunger and food waste. Since we published our first book, there have been many changes in technology, so this book includes information on how it is possible to use the web, internet, and mobile phones, ask Dulson, the organizing of your local Food Not Bombs chapter. People have also suggested that the book would be more useful if it included recipes for smaller numbers of people. Therefore, we have included recipes for groups, all four to six people. During my travels, I also found that volunteers in other countries use different measurements, so each to include all the major ways of measuring out the ingredient in each recipe. I briefly cover all 30 years of Food Not Bombs in this volume, but intend to write a more detailed account in a second book. This book also includes a timeline of major events in the history of Food Not Bombs and samples of flyers, forms, and other resources your local group can use to be more effective. So many volunteers have dedicated years of their own lives to working with Food Not Bombs that many people are qualified and experienced enough to write books about the movement from their perspective. This book, I Sin No I Manto, be the official manual or last word about Food Not Bombs, Food Not Bombsis, a living dynamic global project. And this book reflects some of what I have experienced during my 30 years of volunteering with this inspiring movement. I have done what I can to incorporate the many lessons, ideas, and innovations people have shared with me over the decades. This book also reflects information I've been blessed to receive from Food Not Bombs activists in many areas of the world and from my work helping people start local chapters or assisting with the many problems groups encounter. It is an honor to be a part of Food Not Bombs, and I hope you will be inspired to participate and consider dedicating your time and Diasto seeking an end to war, poverty, exploitation, and the destruction of the environment while building a sustainable future free of coercion, violence, and suffering. After seeing all that has been possible so far, who knows what the Food Not Bombs movement will achieve in the future. Fomer, humble start sharing vegetarian meals during our performances in Harvard Square and daily food distribution to the residents of public housing in the Boston area. Food Not Bombs has become a global movement sharing food and literature in over 1,000 communities. By organizing homes, not jails, housing occupations, free radio stations, food not lawns, community gardens, and setting up really, really free markets in local parks, we on our way to building the world we know is possible. Is it possible that Food Not Bombs will move from being a colorful subculture to becoming part of the foundation of a new society of peace, justice, and well-being? Time will tell. Food Not Bombs can provide some direction after the riots, replacing the corporate-dominated system with one that respects the ideas and rights of everyone in our community. We have the possibility of building a world where everyone is safe and has all they require. This is our time to make something better and lasting. We hope you will join us after the riots and help us make a world with Food Not Bombs. Food Not Bombs co-founder Keith McHenry, who, th, Food Not Bombs shares lunch outside the Cologne Cathedral in Germany. Section 1. Solidarity, not charity. The principles of food, not bombs. 1. The food is always vegan or vegetarian and free to everyone without restriction, rich or poor, stoned or sober. 2. Food Not Bombs has no formal leaders or headquarters, and every group is autonomous and makes decisions using the consensus process. 3. Food Not Bombs is dedicated to nonviolent direct action and works for nonviolent social change. They don't want to feed the hungry. They just want to make an anarchist type statement, and we aren't going to allow it. San Francisco Police Captain Dennis Martell. The name Food Not Bombs states our most fundamental principle. Society needs to promote life, not death. Implement the positive and end cooperation with the negative. Live in a world of abundance and stop fearing a future of scarcity. Celebrate with love, not hate, cooperation instead of domination, and compassion, not exploitation. Food Not Bombs. Devote our time and resources for the real security of food, shelter, education, and healthcare instead of on weapons, military forces, prisons, and social control. By sharing free food without restrictions, we illustrate the fact that there is an abundance of the things we need and that scarcity is a fiction that benefits a small minority. By sharing free meals under the banner Food Not Bombs, the founders of Food Not Bombs seek to educate the public with a message about the national priorities of the United States, pointing out that half the federal budget was spent on the military, including deaths from past wars, while millions went hungry every day. Our society condones and even promotes violence and domination. Authority and power are primarily derived from the threat and use of violence. Uh, this affects our everyday lives through the constant threat of crime, domestic violence, police repression, war, and even the threat of total annihilation from nuclear war, and policies that speed damaging effects of global climate change. Such constant exposure to violence, including the threat of it, leads many people to feel hopeless, helpless, and have low self-esteem. Economic exploitation is another common form of violence, and the fear of poverty and homelessness causes many to work long hours for low wages under stressful or dangerous conditions. 
All of this would be unnecessary if it were not for the need of the wealthy to dominate and control the public so they can maintain their power and prosperity. The use of bombs is the ultimate tool of oppression. The principal goal of food not bombs is to mobilize the people to withdraw their cooperation from this system of violence and coercion. To change society so no one is forced to be hungry, food not bombs has never been considered a charity. Our volunteers are dedicated to taking nonviolent direct action for human rights, animal liberation, the environment, and an end to exploitation and war. The economic and political systems themselves are violent. Poverty is their most pervasive form of violence, and one expression of the violence of poverty is hunger. Over a billion people struggle to have enough to eat because of the decisions of business and government leaders. Trade agreements and laws forcing genetically engineered seeds and chemicals on farmers, commodity speculation, and taxpayer subsidies to agribusiness directly increase hunger. The absence of democracy and access to information are the leading cause of hunger and poverty, not drought, pests, and floods. And therefore, the solution to ending world hunger is the dismantling of our political and economic systems. Of course, we need to make sure everyone has enough to eat today, but if we really want to end hunger, we need more than charity. We need to withdraw our cooperation with those institutions responsible for global poverty and create our own democratic, self-sustainable communities. The Food Not Bombs movement provides food and logistical support to activists protesting war, poverty, exploitation, and domination, while replacing that abusive culture with one of abundance, cooperation, equality, and peace. Our volunteers are working to replace an unsustainable political and economic system with a decentralized democratic set of grassroots solutions that address the real needs of everyone. Food Not Bombs is an organization devoted to developing positive personal, political, and economic alternatives. Revolutionaries are often depicted as working for the overthrow of the government by any means necessary. Food Not Bombs groups spend more resources building a sustainable future than attacking the current system, ready to help with a new vision, ready to create a world after the riots. However, this does not mean we never struggle to end militarism and consumerism. By simply exerting our basic rights to free speech and association, we expose the exploitive, violent nature of the political and economic system. In 1988, corporate and government leaders in the United States started to fear that our message and ideas could become popular and threaten their control, so they organized a campaign of arrests, beatings, disinformation, and litigation in an attempt to silence us. After months of negotiating with the authorities, it became clear that they feared our message and fully meant it when the San Francisco police told the media that they didn't mind that we were feeding the hungry. But what did concern them was that we are making a political statement, and that's not allowed. It cannot be stressed enough that Food Not Bombs is not a charity and is working to inspire a dramatic change in society. Sharing food for free, without restriction, is a revolutionary act in a culture devoted to profit. Sharing food, clothing, time, and compassion with no expecta. Xi'an's has a powerful political impact. As the global economy and environment crash from one emergency to another, more people are discovering the folly of seeking wealth on the stock exchange or of relying on pensions, guns, or gold and silver to provide security. People really need safe food, water, air, shelter, clothing, and, most importantly, community. Food Not Bombs volunteers are building new alternatives and life-affirming structures from the ground up. We want to replace the consumerist death culture with a cooperative culture of daycare not warfare, clean water not chemical weapons, food not lawns, homes not jails, really really free markets, bikes not bombs, and healthcare not warfare. The food not bombs model can be applied to all aspects of our community. As community after community experiences one crisis after another, more people are adopting the principles that have made it possible for food not bombs to flourish for over three decades. Food Not Bombs volunteers respond to poverty and lack of self-esteem in at least two ways. First, we provide food in an open, respectful way to whoever wants it without restriction, rich or poor, sober or not. We will not make people jump through any bureaucratic hoops designed to control, humiliate, and often punish people without money. Second, we invite people who receive the food to become involved in participating in the collection, cooking or sharing of the food. Food Not Bombs volunteers work in solidarity with many members of their community and encourage everyone's participation in all aspects of our local chapters, including help with decision-making. People eating with food, not bombs, should never feel that they are in any way inferior to those who are sharing the food. We are all equal. This isn't charity. This provides an opportunity for people to regain their power and recognize their ability to contribute and make a change. This could be one of the most important ways food, not bombs, contributes to social change. The idea of food recovery, or food recycling, is not the invention of food, not bombs. Individuals have been gleaning, dumpster diving, or skipping to find food for a long time. From the diggers of San Francisco in the last years of the 1960s to the diggers of 1638 on St. George's Hill in England, and back tens of thousands of years to our hunting and gathering ancestors, people have been gleaning for food. Food Not Bombs is just a bit more organized and systematic about recovering surplus food. As a result, our volunteers can have more success at collecting larger amounts of food, making it possible to make it available to more people. As the price of food increases, store owners are starting to poison their discarded products, locking dumpsters, paying security guards to keep people from receiving what has been thrown out, and installing trash compactor stow discourage this practice. Astity published in 2009 reported that there was enough discarded food to provide all 1 billion hungry people with the nutrition they require to be healthy. Another study that same year showed that over 40% of the food produced in the United States was discarded. Food Not Bombs volunteers have overcome these. 
obstacles by talking with produce workers, bakers, and the owners of the smaller independent shops, and by organizing the collection off their surplus. Even with our system of collection, food not bombs groups find that some of the food is just not fit to eat and must be composted. So the final destination for some of what our volunteers collect ends up in the compost piles at local community gardens, but not until all the edible food is distributed to the public. Therefore, it is a radical political act in today's wasteful society to recover large amounts of food in an organized and consistent manner to share with the hungry. Although Food Not Bombs does not have a strict political platform, there is a general political philosophy with which it has become identified over the years. The three principles of Food Not Bombs were first formally suggested and adopted at the 1,992 Food Not Bombs International Gathering in San Francisco. First, the food is always vegan or vegetarian and shared with anyone without restriction, whether they are drunk or sober, rich or poor. Another principle is that each local group is independent and autonomous, has no leaders, and uses consensus to make decisions. There is no president, headquarters, national office, or board of directors. The third principle is that every Food Not Bombs group is dedicated to taking nonviolent direct action and social change. Every individual and group chooses its own values and politics within these broad set of principles. This chapter presents some of this philosophy from the author's own perspective, gained from 30 years of interacting with Food Not Bombs activists from all over the world, but does not represent an official critique and makes it possible for every chapter to adapt to the local conditions and time in which they are operating, while providing a form of continuity and political philosophy at the core of our effort to change society. A new society. Food is a right, not a privilege. Like many other people, we are concerned about the direction in which the world is headed. Domination, violence, and killing seem to be the predominant choices of those with the most power in our society. This is what we often refer to as a culture of death. Acceptance of war, nuclear annihilation, environmental destruction, and genocide are widespread in popular culture, religious institutions, think tanks, corporate boardrooms, and the halls of government. More than ever, this death culture is pushing the idea that it is necessary for young people to join the army and kill to have peace. We have a society that suggests we can shop our way to a sustainable environment and poison our body as to health. Peace through the threat of war is impossible because using the threat of destruction as a way to prevent war is nothing but domination. It is not lost upon us that the major contribution to stopping bombs is our withdrawal from the economic and political structures of the culture of death. As individuals, many of us engage in war tax resistance. As an organization, we operate outside the dominant economic paradigm. We do not operate for a profit. In fact, we operate with very little money compared to the value of the food we distribute. We generally ignore the authorities, having as little contact with them as possible, but as we want exposure for our life-affirming alternatives, we never attempt to hide our intentions. It is unlikely that our plans and intentions could be hidden from the authorities anyway, and, in fact, public knowledge of our plans for nonviolent direct action can become an essential aspect of our strategy. Dedication to our principles and an understanding of ourselves and our organizations as equals to the authorities are also essential to our ability to succeed at influencing positive social change. As Jonathan Shell wrote, a new superpower possesses immense power, but it is a different kind of power. Not the will of one man wielding the 21,000-pound Moab bomb, but the hearts and wills of the majority of the world's people. Atlanta Food Not Bombs shares food near the birthplace of Martin Luther King Jr., people waiting for Addis Ababa Food Not Bombs near St. George's Church in Ethiopia. Don't ask me how to burn down a building, ask me how to grow watermelons, or how to explain nature to a child. Radical animal liberation activist Rod Coronado. Nonviolence in theory. Nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation can be the most effective way to achieve long-lasting, positive social change. There is dignity in nonviolent resistance, a dignity needed to sustain change. To be effective, it is often necessary to have large numbers of supporters and be persistent. Your intentions should be clear to both the institutions resisting change and the people you intend to attract as supporters. Honesty and truth are your most important allies. While often difficult, compassion and respect for your opponents combined with truth and honesty are essential to undermining the power of even the most ruthless and inhumane institutions. The longer and more violent the repression, the harder it is to remain compassionate, but by retaining your integrity in the face of extreme conditions, you will often attract increased popular support and weaken the resolve of those forces hired to end your efforts. Your participants will also maintain their sense of pride and increase their feeling of empowerment the longer they remain dedicated to nonviolence. Nonviolence means responding to situations of injustice with action. However, nonviolence should not be confused with being passive, withholding support, and not cooperating with institutions and poli. Size of violence, exploitation, and injustice is a principal technique of nonviolent resistance. Just because your participants are dedicated to nonviolence, you can't expect the authorities to restrain their violence. Often the state will increase its violence if it believes your campaign is becoming successful, but as repression grows, so will your support. What might seem like months and maybe years of failure can change suddenly. San Francisco Food Not Bombs persisted in sharing food every week for seven years of near-daily arrests that became violent. And in 1995, the local media, which had been very critical of our position, announced support for our work and ridiculed city officials for wasting money and resources on stopping our meals. Their reports reflected the perspective of corporate and political leaders in the Bay Area that came to see it was not possible to stop food, not bombs. Our persistence and dedication to nonviolence attracted public support. Our volunteers would not give up, knowing that if we did, 
future efforts to silence food, not bombs groups in other cities could seem possible. The San Francisco police officers hired to arrest and beat us withdrew their support for the campaign against food, not bombs, and started to see themselves as allies of our volunteers against those ordering the repression. Seven years of building relationships with the officers caused the department leaders to first issue an order to stop fraternizing with our volunteers. And once it became clear that they could not count on their patrolmen and women to continue arresting and beating us with enough enthusiasm, they called off the whole project. The officers grew to see we were honest, caring people, and not the anti-American criminals bent on disobeying the law out of self-interest, as they had been told by their superiors. Corporate and government leaders ended the campaign in order to protect their illusion of control, worried that if it became clear to the public that our persistence and relationships with the police had worked, more sectors of the community might withdraw their support for their authority. Imagine if the patrol officers were perceived by the public as refusing orders. What would be next? It is extremely important that we act in a manner which is consistent with our values. We want a future safe from violence and exploitation. It is never in our interest to use violence against the police or others. Campaigns of violence, even against the most unethical opponents, can be very disempowering. And even as successful at overpowering the opposition, they put in a new institution that relies on violence to protect its authority. If the power changes hands after a campaign of nonviolence, it is more likely that the new institutions will have popular support and maintain their power through consent of the people. On the practical side, the dominant power usually can muster significantly more violent force than we can. The authorities strive to engage their opponents in a realm where they have the advantage, such as armed conflict. But more philosophically, we don't want to use power for domination in our efforts for social change. Imagine if San Francisco Food Not Bombs adopted a strategy of throwing rocks at the police when they came to arrest us. Instead of the public understanding our message that the government and corporations are intentionally redirecting resources towards the military while letting thousands go without food, the impression would have been that the police were justified in using violence to protect themselves and the community from criminals who have no respect for the public, let alone for the police. The media reported extensively for years about how violent our volunteers were after several frustrated activists tossed bagels over a line of riot police to hungry people blocked from getting to the food. We want to create a society based upon human rights and human needs, not dependent on the threat and use of violence. We do not want to dominate. We want to seek the truth and support each other as we work to resolve conflicts without violence. Even the food we choose to serve is an expression of our commitment to nonviolence. We try to avoid using any animal products because we see the damage it does not only to the animals being exploited, but to ourselves, the environment, and the economy. Mainstream food production is an inherently violent process involving cruel living conditions and the slaughter of millions of animals and the poisoning of the air, water, soil, and our own bodies with chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and genetically engineered food. The meat and dairy industries control government policies that primarily serve their own financial interests and not those of the public. We couldn't work for peace and ignore the violence of corporate food production that defines living beings as commodities and products to be manufactured and sold for profit. Our commitment to nonviolence also extends to working to end the violence and pain of hunger and poverty, the fear of not being able to provide for oneself or one's family and friends, the violence that over a billion people barely survive every day as they seek enough nutrition to live another day, food that is withheld or too costly to purchase so corporate leaders can maximize their profits and power. Nonviolence in practice. Food Not Bombs is a unique example of nonviolence in practice. When we were first arrested, supporters noted that sharing free food with the hungry is America's version of India's salt marches. Even in 1988, hunger in America had become a national embarrassment. Arresting volunteers for sharing vegan meals with the hungry was a graphic example of the misguided policies of corporate and political leaders in the United States. Sharing vegan food in defiance of the state requires popular participation, just as with any other form of nonviolent resistance. Food Not Bombs adopted the use of consensus to make decisions as a key part of our practice of nonviolence. As an organization, we strive to be very inclusive. Our decision-making process invites a diversity of participants to shape the direction of each Food Not Bombs chapter. There is room for all respectful political perspectives and for everyone to express themselves. For some, the decision to work for food not bombs is a total change in lifestyle. For others, the decision is expressed through a commitment to life-affirming values while continuing to work at a job for pay in mainstream society. Still, we are seeking to replace the current system based on violence. We try to value individuals for the contribution they offer, without any expectation that they be completely divorced from the status quo. The practice of nonviolence includes respect for all cultural backgrounds. Our world is multicultural. Social and political structure should be sensitive to this reality. Challenging racism, classism, gender bias, homophobia, and other oppressive behaviors is essential to creating a life-affirming, self-sustaining world. Everyone needs to be engaged in multicultural work, and this includes the members of Food Not Bombs, as well as those with whom we come in contact, both on the street and within the other service and political organizations with which we work. Eating with Food Not Bombs in Reykjavik, Iceland. One of the unique ways in which Food Not Bombs engages in multicultural work is the creation of ways to share access to resources. Members identify and obtain food the wider community needs. We provide an example of how a small group of people with limited economic resources can make a big difference in the quality of life for many people by organizing and recovering a waste product of the existing society. It is our hope that the redistribution of resources, other than food, becomes an activity that is taken on by an increasingly larger number of people. After all, we are the people 
we are trying to serve. Food.bombs groups area open and democratic. Regular meetings provide access for everyone to participate in the direction of the group. Meetings might not seem fun or necessary until your group learns to use consensus well and experiences the empowerment that can cultivate. Decisions are made using a process called consensus. Consensus creates an environment in which different opinions can be expressed without fear and where conflicts can be resolved in a respectful, non-violent manner. It is not a competition of ideas to see which one wins the favor of the group as happens with voting. Rather, I just working cooperatively to synthesize a litias into the best possible decision for everyone involved. The consensus process Travesto assure that everyone has an opportunity to share their point of view and to participate in decision making. Consensus does not mean that everyone thinks the same way. People can agree to disagree and still reach. Consensus. People become empowered when encouraged to participate and take more responsibility for the decisions and actions of the group. This teaches them not only how to be powerful non-violently, but also how to seek access to power within food, not bombs, and the other areas of society. We will never live in a society with equal power shared by all people. However, it is possible to imagine a world in which everyone has equal access to power and along those lines. Consensus is a process based upon the opportunity for all to participate in decision making. The particular model your group chooses to use will be determined by your size and needs. Our use of consensus inspires dedication to the decisions of each food not bombs group and makes it much more likely that everyone participating will have the greatest commitment to the goals and actions of our movement. It is hard for the authorities to successfully disrupt and stop food not bombs since each volunteer has the experience of formulating the decisions of their chapter. The uprisings in early 2011 show how important it is to establish democratic organizations that are able to replace oppressive social structures before the vacuum is filled by a new set of dictators. The Manual on Conflict and Consensus describes a model of consensus called formal consensus, the foundation for consensus used by many food not bombs. Groups, food not bombs, Mayday Action Germany, eating lunch with food not bombs in Poznan, Poland. Food, a hungry man is an angry man, Bob Marley, them belly full but we hungry. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Martin Luther King Jr. The world produces enough food to feed everyone, if distributed equally. There is an abundance of food. In fact, in many countries, every day in every city, far more edible food is discarded than is needed to feed those who do not have enough to eat. Yet, over a billion people go hungry every day. Consider this. Before food reaches your table, it is produced and handled by farmers, co-ops, manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, and retailers. Some perfectly edible food is discarded for a variety of business reasons at every step. In the average city, approximately 10% of all solid waste is food. This is an incredible total of 50 billion pounds per year, or just under 200 pounds per person per year. Over $100 billion worth of edible food a year is discarded in the United States. This is also true in many countries in Europe as well as in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Canada. With the exception of Africa and parts of Asia, where the poverty is so great that little edible food is discarded, it is also possible to recover large amounts of food that can't be sold in nearly every community. Estimates indicate that only 4 billion pounds of food per year would be required to completely end hunger in the United States. A 2008 study by the Food Ethics Council in Ng. Land argues that excessive consumption of food by people in wealthy countries is increasing food prices for people in the developing world, and that by utilizing the millions of tons of edible food that is thrown away each year. In just the US and UK, more than a billion people could be lifted out of hunger worldwide. Clearly, there is an abundance of edible, recoverable food being thrown away. To recover this edible food and use it to feed people, three key elements must be combined. First, the food must be collected. Second, it must be organized or prepared in a form appropriate for consumption. Third, the food must be made easily accessible to those who are hungry. The reason this is not already happening is no accident. We do not have a democratic say in how food is produced or distributed. People would certainly elect to have enough to eat, but in hierarchical economies where the threat of job loss allows owners to keep wages low, the intentional withholding of food helps increase its price. A policy of scarcity is essential to political and economic control. An underclass results from such policies that encourage domination and violence. In our society, it is acceptable to profit from other suffering and misery. Hunger in the United States is staggering. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, reported in 2008 that, off 49, 1 million people living in food insecure households up from 36, 2 million in 2007, 32. 4 million are adults, 4% of all adults, and 16.7 million are children. The U.S. Department of Agriculture report published in November 2010 showed that nearly 15% of all Americans, or 49 million U.S. residents, including 17 million children, lacked adequate food at some point during 2009. The deterioration in access to food during 2008 among both children and adults far eclipses that of any other single year in the report's history. It was reported that 17.3 million people lived in households that were considered to have very low food security, a U.S. to term previously denominated food insecure with hunger. That means one or more people in the household were hungry over the course of the year because of the inability to afford enough food. This was up from 11.9 million in 2007 and 8.5 million in 2000s. 
Very low food security had been getting worse even before the recession. The number of people in this category in 2008 was more than double the number in 2000s. Race has a huge impact in the United States with 25.7% of black households and 26.9% of Hispanic American households experiencing food insecurity in far higher red tests than the national average. Three and a half million Americans over 65 years of age live in poverty and struggle to balance the needs of food, medicine, rent, or heat each month. The Agriculture Department said 39.68 million people, or one in eight Americans, were enrolled for food stamps during February 2010, an increase of 260,000 from January of 2010. By February 2012, the number stood at 46, 224,722. Global poverty and hunger is also increasing. The World Food Organization reports 1.0. 2 billion people in 2009 do not have enough to eat, more than the combined populations of USA, Canada, and the European Union. 25,000 people, adults and children, died every day in 2009 from hunger and related causes. The number of undernourished people in the world increased by 75 million in 2007 and 40 million in 2008, largely due to higher food prices from speculation and the high cost of seeds and chemicals from introduction of genetically modified products that have forced many farmers into bankruptcy. 907 million people in developing countries were hungry during 2009. More than 60% of chronically hungry people of the world were women in 2009. Every six seconds, a child dies because of hunger and related causes in 2009. Clearly, the majority of people going hungry today are not the stereotype homeless wandering America's streets or starving Africans. Hungry people are children and single parents, mostly women. The working poor, the unemployed, the elderly, the chronically ill, and those on fixed. Incomes such as veterans and people with physical and mental challenges, differences, disabilities. All of these people find themselves in the clutches of oppressive poverty, even while trying to improve their condition. With the global economy in a state of crisis, Many people who thought of themselves as middle class just a year or two ago are now finding that they must rely on soup kitchens and food banks to feed their families. Each month, more and more people in the United States and other wealthy countries need to choose between paying rent, heat, or food. In 1988, Food Not Bombs published a flyer with the shocking information that the World Food Organization had reported that 15,000 people died every day from hunger and related causes. Every few years we found we had to change the number upwards. In 2008, our flyer said 24,000 died every day from hunger in. 2009, we changed it to 25,000, which the World Food Program reports has remained unchanged in 2013. In addition to the collection and distribution of surplus food to help solve this problem, Food Not Bombs has encouraged vegetarianism and a vegan lifestyle since the day we started in 1980. If more people were vegan and demanded organically grown, locally produced foods, this would encourage organic farming practices and support smaller farms. This, in turn, would make it easier to decentralize the means of food production and to create democratic control over the quality of food produced and encourage the stewardship of the land. More people can be fed from one acre of land on a plant-based diet than on a meat-based diet. Our society's current meat-based diet promotes centralized, profit-driven agribusinesses and a dependency on chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and genetically modified crops, resulting in the declining nutritional value of the food that is produced, while contributing to the destruction of our environment. Mass-produced meats are full of chemicals, drugs, enhancers, and preservatives, while our milk has been contaminated with radioactive fallout and chemical contamination from drugs and hormones. When we started, Food Not Bombs shared vegan food to encourage a move to a plant-based diet by showing that it is just as nutritious and tasty as the more environmentally destructive and unhealthy meat-centered diet. We had read Francis Moore Lappe's diet for a small planet and became convinced that one way to reduce hunger and protect the environment was to introduce the public to a vegan diet. Where she reported startling facts about the pressure of meat production on water and land. She pointed out that an acre of cereals produces five times more protein than an acre devoted to beef production, and that it takes 16 pounds of grain to make a pound of meat. Since we first read Diet for a Small Planet, the need to encourage the public to change its eating habits has become more urgent than ever. Hungry for Peace 29. Food Not Bombs Kitchen in Poland using equipment donated by groups in the Netherlands. Changing to a vegan diet is one effective way to reduce hunger since it is possible to feed many more people on less land and with less water on a plant-based diet than one that relies on meat production. Cornell University scientists report that the U.S. could feed 800 million people with grain that is now fed to livestock. The grain that is currently fed to animals for global meat production could feed over 2 billion people. The World Watch Institute shows that it takes 49 gallons of water to produce a pound of apples, 33 gallons to produce a pound of carrots, 24 gallons to produce a pound of potatoes, 23 gallons for a pound of tomatoes, and 2,500 gallons of water to produce a pound of beef. The U.S. Department of Agriculture claims that one acre of farmland can produce 356 pounds of protein from soybeans, 265 pounds from rice, 211 from corn, or 192 from legumes. They report that when the same acre is used for animal production, these numbers drop drastically. Only 82 pounds of protein are produced from milk, 78 from eggs, and only 20 pounds of protein if the acre is being used to produce beef. Food production is also tied to solving the crisis of climate change. This urgent crisis can be slowed if everyone eats a more plant-based diet. 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change urges the public to change to a plant-based diet to help slow climate change. A 2006 report by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, found that worldwide livestock farming generates 18% of the planet's green. House gas emissions. While all the cars, planes, trains, and boats on Earth account for a combined total of just 13% of all greenhouse gas emissions. The clear cutting of forests for grazing lands adds to the destruction of our atmosphere, while the high concentrations of methane from factory meat production contribute gases responsible for climate change. Factory meat farming dumps large amounts of toxic waste into our waterways, and the chemicals used for corporate agriculture wash into the rivers and oceans, killing fish and destabilizing ecosystems. A vegan diet would be better for the environment, consume fewer resources, and be healthier for each of us. While we encourage awareness of vegan living for political and economic reasons, this policy also has several more immediate and practical benefits. The potential for problems with food spoilage are greatly reduced when dealing strictly with vegetables, fruit, and other vegan foods. Our volunteers tend to eat a more healthy diet as they learn more about veganism. Our diet reflects our desire to promote a nonviolent future. Teaching people about the health benefits of a vegan diet actually creates a healthy, caring attitude towards ourselves, others, and the planet as a whole. Therefore, all of the food we prepare is strictly from plant sources, that is no meat, dairy, or eggs. Introducing the public to vegan food is one direct way that Food Not Bombs seeks to influence change. Some of the bread or pastries might have eggs, honey, or dairy, but otherwise, our food is vegan. People know and trust the standard for Food Not Bombs food whenever they come to eat with us. A volunteer with Bangkok Food Not Bombs cooks meal for the hungry in Thailand, not bombs. The message is clear, there can be no peace until people have enough to eat. Hungry people are not peaceful people. Former President Jimmy Carter, June 17, 1999. The not bombs part of our mission is just as important as the food. The War Resisters League publishes a report showing that over 50 cents of every federal tax dollar is spent on the military. The Center for Defense Information and Friends Committee on. National legislation are among those issuing studies showing that about half the money the public pays to the U.S. federal government is spent on the military. Other governments and corporations also spend huge amounts on weapon systems and preparation for war. It will take imagination and work to create a world without bombs. Our meals always include the Food Not Bombs banner and free literature on subjects related to peace, social justice, animal liberation, and the environment, encouraging discussions about these urgent issues among the people visiting our table. Our literature has inspired new projects and creative protests generated by the lively conversations during our meals. Changing society so no one needs to depend on charity is central to the Not Bombs aspect of Food Not Bombs. The Not Bombs organizing of Food Not Bombs seeks to change society and redirect our resources from bombs to food. And we sure do spend a great deal on bombs. The New York Times reported world arms sales between countries by weapons manufacturers at $55.20, billion in 2008. Jane's Defense Weekly reports that weapons exports totaled $73 billion in 2012. Weapons contracts by the United States were valued at $37.80, billion in 2008, or 68.4% of all business in the global arms bazaar, a large increase from U.S. sales of $25.40. Billion in 2007. This does not include a direct cost for each military. President Obama's 2010 State of the Union address said, Starting in 2011, we are prepared to freeze government spending for three years. Changing spending related to our national security, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security will not be affected. Obama requested $663.70 billion for the 2010 Defense Department budget. Imagine how many people could be fed on $600 billion. The Tomahawk land attack missile T-LAM, an all-weather, long-range, subsonic cruise missile used for land attack warfare, costs approximately $569,000 per unit in 1999 and $1.40. Million per missile in 2010, according to the U.S. Navy's official website. The total cost of the military program was $11.1 trillion, $1 trillion for the entire order of 4,170 missiles built by Raytheon Systems Company in Tucson, Arizona. Imagine how much food could be provided for the cost of one cruise missile. In 2008, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, served 2,008.4 million people a month at an annual cost of $34.60 billion. In February 2010, SNAP provided 39.68 million Americans an average monthly benefit of $133.12. Per person, the highest number of people receiving food stamps since the program began in 1962. In contrast, Food Not Bombs can provide over four meals per one dollar using recovered organic produce and high-quality baked goods. 32. Hungry for peace. Volunteers cooking in Nairobi, Kenya. The Food Not Bombs table provides more than a healthy meal. It provides a space for inspiring discussion and action. A conversation drawn from one of our flyers on the dangers of genetically engineered food can evolve into a plan to organize a protest outside Monsanto and the creation of a local seed bank. Literature about the suffering of factory-produced chickens and cattle might generate a discussion that leads to participation in the annual anti-McDonald's Day action. It is not easy for the public to learn of the many issues Food Not Bombs is concerned with. The corporate media is not likely to introduce the community to the problems created by their sponsors. For many people, a visit to the Food Not Bombs table is their first introduction to a movement for social change. 
Many people believe they are alone in thinking something is wrong with our economic and political system until they happen upon Food Not Bombs. Food Not Bombs groups provide information about many issues and announcements for campaigns and protests, information not likely to be easily found any other place. Food Not Bombs recognizes our part in providing sustenance for people at protests, demonstrations, and other events so that they can continue participating in the long-term struggle against militarism. We build solidarity by sharing food and literature at events and actions organized by other groups. We also distribute literature at our meals that is provided by the organizations we support, promoting solidarity and the building of coalitions. Offering food and logistical support is a great way to create lasting relationships with activists working on issues related to the goals of food, not bombs. We are working against the perception of scarcity, which causes many people to fear cooperation among groups. They believe that they must keep apart to preserve their resources, so we try to encourage the feeling of abundance and the recognition that if we cooperate together, all become stronger. Providing food at the center of the action is part of our vision. Sometimes we organize an event, sometimes we provide food at other organizations' events. Being able to provide food for more than one day is more than just a good idea, it is a necessity. Either the movement can seek food services from the outside and be dependent upon businesses which may not be progressive and may be susceptible to coercion, or we can provide for ourselves. Clearly it is food, not bombs position that providing for our own basic needs, in ways that comprehensively support the movement, is far more empowering. We have provided food at long-term direct actions, such as the peace encampments at the Nevada nuclear weapons test site, tent cities which highlight homelessness and hunger in San Francisco, Boston, New York, and Washington. D.C., a 600-day farm workers vigil in Sarajevo, the 100-day tent city protest during the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, border camps in Europe, North America and the Middle East, base camps working to block logging or mining destruction, and at tent embassy actions supporting native people's rights to relief efforts, as we did for eight months in nearly 20 cities wiped out by Hurricane Katrina. Food Not Bombs can help make it possible to take action for as long as it takes to influence change. With sustained protest, it might even be possible to overthrow a government, but then the resulting power vacuum needs to be filled. A 100-day tent city protest brought down the Ukrainian government. Food Not Bombs showed that by providing free meals to the protesters outside the parliament, it was possible for them to sustain the protest for months. Carefully planned strategies of strikes, blockades, occupations, and other mass actions, like tent city protests, can pressure corporations and governments to collapse. But then the real problem has been how to replace the failed system with a democratic process that respects the dignity and will of the people, while providing the basic needs of food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, and education for everyone. Is hunger and poverty really caused by the personal failure of those who find themselves poor, or could it be as a result of intentional economic and political policies? Asking this question has brought food not bombs in conflict with the authorities. Business and retail interests can believe that the presence of homeless people will drive away shoppers and property buyers. Food Not Bombs has also attracted the attention of military contractors as well as local state and federal law enforcement agencies who appear to be fearful that the movement's message might influence you as taxpayersto. See that their money could potentially be better spent on things like food, education, and healthcare instead of being wasted on overpriced and unnecessary military programs. In the summer of 1988, Food Not Bombs, volunteers started to get arrested for what the police claimed was a political statement by sharing free vegan meals to the hungry in San Francisco, California. The San Francisco police made nearly 1,000 arrests for feeding the hungry without permission. Volunteers were also arrested in Arcata, Los Angeles, Santa Cruz, and other California communities, sometimes because off the group's message of redirecting taxes towards human needs, and sometimes because officials believe the free meals were interfering with the city's efforts to drive the homeless out of sight. City police in Las Vegas, Nevada, Orlando, and Tampa, Florida, Middletown, Connecticut, and a number of other communities in the United States were also arrested for sharing free meals without permission. In the first few months of 2012, people all over the United States asked for help after having been told they would be arrested for sharing food with the hungry. One woman, Kathy, started an online petition after police in Daytona Beach, Florida, stopped her from sharing sandwiches. That same week, another woman, Amanda, emailed us her petition after police stopped here in Dallas, Texas. Santa Monica, California passed a law restricting gatherings of over 75 people, and the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania introduced restrictions on feeding homeless people. Food Not Bombs volunteers also found themselves under investigation by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the American Civil Liberties Union and other lawyers have discovered internal memos showing that Food Not Bombs was considered a terrorist threat. A few Food Not Bombs volunteers were arrested as environmental and animal rights terrorists and charged with planning acts of arson or vandalism that were actually proposed or carried out by paid informants directed by the FBI, state police, or agents with Homeland Security, as happened with Eric McDavid, Brandon Baxter, and Connor Stevens. Most times, the campaign to portray Food Not Bombs volunteers as criminals often backfires, inspiring people to join their local chapter, start new Food Not Bombs groups, or provide contributions off food and money. Efforts to silence Food Not Bombs help inform the public about the politics of food in our society and have inspired the growth in Food Not Bombs groups to every corner of the world. How Food Not Bombs Got Its Name This slogan requires no complicated analysis. Those three words say it all. They point unerringly to the double challenge, to feed immediately people who are without adequate food, and to replace a system whose priorities are power and profit with one meeting the needs of all human beings. Professor Howard Zinn
When I started to collect the discarded produce from my job at Bread and Circus in Cambridge, I looked for people that might enjoy free food. I found a cluster of dilapidated public housing building a few blocks east off the grocery. Groups of skinny children and their mothers huddled in the cold on the steps of these broken buildings since Shadowoff. A group of modern glass towers where scientists were busy designing guidance systems for intercontinental nuclear missiles. This sure made it clear that what? People really needed wasp food and not bombs. At the time, our collective started gathering discarded food. We were also reading publications from the War Resisters League and other organizations that reported that around 50 cents of every federal tax dollar was being spent on the military, interest for money borrowed for war, and care for veterans. The United States continues to spend more than half its federal budget on the military. We were also influenced by Henry David Thoreau's protest against paying for war. Thoreau wrote that, if a thousand men were not to pay their tax bills this year, that would not be a violent and bloody measure, as it would be to pay them, and enable the state to commit violence and shed innocent blood. This is, in fact, the definition of a peaceable revolution, if any such is possible. One of our many activities waste spray paint anti-nuclear and anti-war slogans on public buildings and sidewalks using stencils. One of our favorite statements during this time of high food prices was to spray paint the words, money for food, not for bombs, at the exits to large commercial groceries in our neighborhood. One night, after an outing of spray painting, we had the inspiration to shorten the slogan to Food Not Bombs and use it as the name of our collective. We had been active with the Clam Shell Alliance and found, most people thought the group's main focus was to promotion off the clamming industry, not realizing we were an anti-nuclear group. To correct this problem, we thought by calling ourselves Food Not Bombs, our message would be clear, and by repeating our name over and over again. Even the media would get the political concept of food and not bomb stow the public. But the most important aspect of calling ourselves food, not bomb cyst that we do not have to proselytize because our name says it all. When we arrive with the food, people simply say, hey, here comes food, not bombs. Foo. Food, not bombs. Activists sharing vegan meals in New Brunswick, Canada.